This is part two of a special two-part episode where I interview Joey Sieber. We take a deeper dive into Level Legal and end with a tribute to the Baylor Bears winning 2021 NCAA Basketball Championship. This is Bart Peterson, and you are listening to the FCPA Compliance Report on the Compliance Podcast Network. The FCPA Compliance Report is a production of the Compliance Podcast Network. Over the past... Past, we're recording this in early Q2 of 2021, but over the past year during the coronavirus health crisis, have you seen compliance risk change or perhaps your clients' compliance risk change? And if so, sort of what guidance have you given them? Yeah, well, first of all, let's just think about, let's just, just the calendar and the, let's start with CCPA. Set aside the coronavirus stimulus, cash, fraud, all those things. Just the calendar in the last year, uh, beginning of 2020, I think January 1, 2020 was was the deadline for compliance with the CCPA. And then as I understand it, the, you know, AG took some time to determine, um, you know, enforcement and how that was going to be done. I think there's still, still, some questions there. Uh, And then other states have passed and are beginning to enforce compliance, I mean, uh, privacy laws. So just that alone is beginning to now seep through and cause cause companies in particular to, to be concerned. You lay on COVID, working from home, privacy issues there, Stimulus money, corporate stimulus money, the potential for fraud, the potential for, you know, privacy violations or privacy, um, yeah, privacy violations. It's become a much more complex field. Um, How are we advising our clients? (laughs) Be very careful. Um, And, you you know, it's it's one of those things that um, you have to assess the risk. People are still in the process of doing that, seeing how various states are going to enforce, you know, their particular statutes, um, and then one bite at a time. Uh, but 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 you start with kind of an assessment of where you are, what you're doing with your data, mapping your data, um, and understanding where it resides. There's a couple of terms I wanted to ask you about. First is what is second level request work. Yeah, second request is in the M and A context, where um, in a in a in a in an acquisition context of a company, I think it's over fifty million dollars is the threshold. They must file uh, an HSA notice, Hart Scott Redino. It's the name of the bill, and this is letting the regulatory agency, whether that be the FTC, DOJ, uh, whomever know that this this acquisition is proposed, and the we'll just say the DOJ. DOJ takes a look at this, and they take a look at the information that has been required to be provided under the HSR. And if they have significant concerns, particularly in the antitrust area then they can make a literal second request for information uh, from the the, uh, company to investigate further whether there are legitimate antitrust concerns. These are quite burdensome. A second request is a quite burdensome uh, undertaking. And there's a very short time frame. So what that means is... You know, the, 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 the burden is often requiring uh, examination of millions of documents and emails, particularly looking at the communications both internally and externally around the transaction to determine if there was um, any prohibited uh, conduct that was intended, particularly in the antitrust area. Um, so it's a fast-moving large-scale, government-initiated review, um, that's what it is. 
Department of Justice, I think, has made clear that they will uh, increase antitrust and anti-competitive scrutiny. But we've also had the FTC, uh, I think, now formally state that they're going to increase their reviews of mergers and other um, anti-competitive issues. How would you suggest companies uh, prepare for these uh, increased scrutinies? Is it uh, risk assessment? Is it uh, looking at their own uh, situations or when you're counseling companies, what are you telling them uh, today? You know, it's, it's, it's pretty simple, pretty simple advice that any good lawyer would give. And that is, um, you know, make sure that you're, make sure that you're preparing early. Don't engage in the kinds of communications or activities that they might be concerned about. The, what is the purpose of your, of your acquisition? And don't, you know, don't allude to any purpose other than that legitimate purpose in communications. You know, um, uh, it's really it's really getting your house in order early uh, uh, is the best kind of top top line top level advice that you would give anybody in, that would be in that situation. How have you seen internal fraud and corruption investigations change over the past year, and how can an uh, ALSP uh, help a company in those endeavors? For us, the way that we, can, first of all, there's not been a there's not been a huge change except in the explosion of you know the amount of data, cost pressures in the corporate environment, um, and, and and kind of the need that those be handled in a high quality way. The way that an ALSP, again, alternative legal service provider, um, can help is first of all with the technology and the proficiency with the technology. There's an abundance of tools available to help with these types of uh, investigations, review databases, um, AI, uh, tools like OneTrust that I mentioned, and you know we are we are we're experts at using those tools, deploying those tools. The end goal is efficiency, uh, whether it's reactive in an investigation or proactive in risk mitigation, um, and we're always looking for the best tools to use to be most efficient. So. That is one w- way in which we are particularly well suited to handle those. You know, there's also always a scarce <laughs> scarcity of resources within the client's organization or even law firms handling it. Uh, again, we're particularly proficient with that. And then, as we mentioned, we develop you know institutionalized knowledge or institutional knowledge uh, when we've worked with clients over the long haul and um, can bring some greater efficiency. Uh, to the to the process. As we move, uh, at least in Texas, now to a more normalized working environment, uh, at least the state's opened up, how can companies try to rebuild culture after literally a year of working from home if they choose to uh, uh, reintegrate into the office or have a, uh, a blended type of work from home and come in a few days a week? Yeah. Uh, you know, my, my flippant answer there, Tom, is if you haven't already, if you haven't worked to maintain your culture in the last year, you're going to have a really tough time kind of getting that back. Um, but it's, you know, it's connecting with your people. It's living your corporate values um, and uh, staying in touch with uh, your people and reengaging with your people. You know, the, the people are the greatest asset of any company. Uh, certainly of ours and the service industries at least. And um, I think uh, hopefully hopefully people have, have have paid attention to culture and engagement even more over the last year. And, um, and so they're picking up where they've left off. There are obvious adjustments that have to be made, right? Um, we're all in, you know, we've been in uncharted territory and we're entering uncharted territory. There's no in my opinion, no going back. We're not going back to anything. We're moving forward to something different. And people will work from home or work in hybrid environments. Um, Many, of course, will go back to their offices, but those offices are going to look different. There are going to be different people there, probably fewer people there. Um, So culture is culture no matter where you are. Sometimes it's just harder to maintain, and hopefully people have been doing that. Uh, during this year. In 2019, the Department of Justice released a document entitled an evaluation of corporate compliance programs, and they updated that in 2020. 
But in 2019, they specifically called out outsourced compliance. And it struck me that that is uh, close to an alternative legal uh, service provider. I was wondering, uh, how do you help or where would you suggest in-house types think about alternative um, uh, legal service providers into 2025 and and perhaps even beyond now that we've had the Department of Justice really uh, say that this we see this as a direction companies could or or should go, and uh, we're going to certainly encourage that. You know, I think that when we think when we think into first of all, I don't think that the term if we look into 2025, I don't think we'll be using the term alternative. (laughs) Okay, Um, they're 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 all they're legal. They're all kinds of legal service providers, not necessarily alternative legal service uh, providers. It's a fragmented uh, industry, if you will. And what we're going to see is increased use of additional legal service providers, non-traditional legal service providers. You know, oftentimes law firms look at um, look at al- alternative legal service providers, ALSPs, as competition. I would invite people to think of it differently. It's really about serving the customer, and I'm going to use customer more than we do client. I think that's one of the things that we've not done well in the industry is think about our client as a customer. Because when you use the term customer, you're you're connotating something different. What does the customer need? What is best for that customer? What's best for one may be likely different from the next. And so what array of providers is best for this issue, for this client, for this deadline or time frame? So I think in 2025, if we look ahead, you're going to see alliances of providers um, creating the best solution for the client. Most of our work comes from attorneys at mostly large law firms who are trying to craft the best solution for their clients and including us in that team. I'll close by close this question by saying this. When we think about the big four and the fact that they have made no secret of the fact that they want to move into the legal market in the United States, they are in the legal market in the United States, worldwide, really. They're already in the C-suite providing, offering additional services. It's much more likely that the what's called what's today called an ALSP in the traditional law firm w- would be able to join forces to offer services um, analogous to what the big four uh, is moving toward. So what's up next for uh, your organization? You know, again, our, um, our work, um, we're co- continuing to work with, with the with wonderful clients that we have growing that footprint, growing, um, you know, we had a wonderful international project uh, last year, cross-border second request, merger and acquisition. So both in the U.S. and and the EU required regulatory approval, uh, continuing to span, expand uh, in that area. And then again, in the compliance area, uh, assisting our clients with the maze that has become the, you know, the <laughs> I guess it's the acronym maze of privacy and um and complying with the various regulations in states and the GDPR, um, we're building a business unit in that in that area to provide those uh, services and to wrap our services again around the tools that are available that are quite good in that area. Um, that's what that's that's our future. Uh, we're getting near the end, but there's a series of questions I wanted to ask you on the unrelated topic to compliance. All right, and that's the Baylor Bears, and I'm gonna. Oh, second bears. I'm going to introduce this by telling you I'm a little bit older than you. And um, when I was in college and high school and thereafter, Baylor was not particularly relevant in the old Southwest Conference or in any other conference. That changed. Uh, RG3, uh, Brittany Griner, um, Baylor Track uh, had some spectacular uh, wins, victories, uh, great personalities and some great athletes. But Baylor's men's basketball um, suffered some some pretty dramatic reversals. 
and had some some real low points. I just wanted to ask you, assuming that you are somewhat of a long suffering Baylor fan, and even when you went to college, really, what did it mean to see the Baylor Bears win the NCAA national championship this year? You know, it was really look. I'll use a Baptist term. It was really redemptive, right? Um, when we to have been through the ups and downs, and like you said, you know, we had some, we had some, we had some good times. I was, you know, while I was in college, Grant Taft was the coach, and um, you know, it was kind of dive right and dive left, and you know, run up the middle, and we had some challenging years, probably a five hundred, um, probably five hundred uh, record on, during my time there. Some great, some great victories, but then some really disappointing times. A, a Grant Taft's a great leader and a great coach, but we we suffered <laughs> for a long time and and kind of athletic mediocrity, you know, with a few exceptions in 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 uh, track and field and tennis, and in women's basketball, of course, um, really improved um, with Kim Mulkey and um, and for you know a couple of decades now they've been really good, and then men's basketball. Um, under Scott Drew for the last 15 years. I, it's hard to believe it's been that long or, or 18 years. Um, you know, he's done a good job. And that that has been a wonderful, redemptive turnaround story. And, uh, you know, for those for those people who kind of groan or grin or roll their eyes and say, you know, you, you've got to indulge us, Baylor fans, uh, for, for our moment because it's been a long time. It's been a long time coming. So it was really, really – it was fantastic to see uh, them play so well and play as a team well. You know, of course, there's some great individual players, but it's a real team effort uh, to win that. And it was just some of the best basketball I've ever seen. Uh, so it was a wonderful experience. <laughs> Thank you for indulging me. <laughs> so I get, I was asked that question. Oh, what would you think about Baylor? You're from Texas. I said, let me explain. I grew up 90 miles from Waco. I did not go to Baylor University. Uh, my parents taught at another university, and so my love of Baylor is, is not high. Yeah, yeah. Unless it was uh, the their four final games were four of the finest yeah. games, and particularly the last two uh, of domination in the national championship I have ever seen yeah. in the NCAA. Yeah, it was. And you know, to, to adding this, you mentioned. Um, I think I think you I think you grew up in Bryan, uh, uh, Bryan College Station, where where Texas A and M is. Look, we have some we have some deep seated rivalries in the state of Texas with um, with our with the old Southwest Conference here and and all of those. I think it's really been wonderful as uh, a Baylor alum and Baylor supporter to see uh, folks like yourself. Um, you know, I think UT lit their tower green and gold and had a BU on it. It's really nice to see us being supportive of each other uh, in the state when, when we kind of move on to the national stage. We should do more of that. Um, it was good to see. Well, unfortunately, uh, now, Joey, we are at the end of our time, but I was wondering if our listeners wanted any more information on any of the topics that uh, we've talked about or find out more information about Level Legal. Where could they go? Yes, of course. Thank you. Uh, of course, www.levellegal.com, levellegal.com. Um, I'm, I'm at jseber, J-S-E-E-B-E-R, at levellegal.com. Uh, and, of course, uh, happy to happy to – chat further if anybody's interested or um, certainly check us out on the website. Joey, this has been a ton of fun and uh, I hope that we can continue the conversation. Yeah, I would love to. Thank you for the opportunity. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox again. I'd like to thank you for listening to this episode of the FCPA Compliance Report, a production of the Compliance Podcast Network. We have a great new show on the Compliance Podcast Network called Mo Forecast, which is podcast of the law firm of Morrison and Forrester, hosted by James Kukios. Check that out on the Compliance Podcast Network. Also, we have a new podcast, Survive and Thrive, where with my co-host, Courtney Nordrum, we take a look at compliance disasters, some of the lessons learned and red flags missed, plus what you can do to avoid them going forward. I know you'll enjoy this great new series, Survive and Thrive, which posts every other Tuesday on the Compliance Podcast Network. Thanks so much for listening, and I look forward to visiting with you again next week.